Healthcare is changing, and Dr. Nancy R.N. is here for you. The topics are many, but each program stands on its own with three key action points for you to learn. Your guide to a healthier you in a changing world. Dr. Nancy R.N. Welcome to Dr. Nancy RN, Healthy You, Healthy Nation, Healthy World. I'm Nancy Valentine, PhD and registered nurse, and this show is considered a wonderful opportunity for you as a consumer to learn more about healthcare so that you will be better at navigating healthcare for yourself. And today we have a very fun topic that we're going to talk about. Fun in that often it's a topic that people don't want to talk about. But we've got a wonderful speaker with us today, Tamara Kerr, who is a professor of nursing at Villanova University. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Tamara before I tell you about uh, what she's going to be speaking with us about today. Tamara has her degree from uh, Gwinnett Mercy College where she earned her BSN and then she went for a master's degree to Thomas Jefferson University and she has a PhD at Villanova University. She has spent over 20 years as a nephrology nurse and she's going to tell you all about uh, kidney disease and that's really part of what we're going to be talking about today. She is working part-time as a kidney dialysis nurse in addition to her work at Villanova. She, and when she uh, was at Jefferson she was a renal clinical nurse specialist and she has been really wonderful in taking this content area and having it translated for nurses all around the country. In fact, she just came back on the red eye from a conference in Las Vegas where she was speaking on her topic. So she is really a very well-known speaker and a real pioneer in the field of nephrology nursing. And our uh, topic today is entitled to pee or not to pee. So that is really our topic for today and the question for today. So Tamara Kerr, thank you so much for being with us and we really look forward to hearing about this, this problem because people may say, gee, nephrology or, or urination, you know, like, like not something I necessarily want to uh, be focusing in on except most people don't realize just how common this illness is. I was really interested when I learned from Tamara when she sent me some information that kidney disease is the eighth leading cause of death in the United States. So it really is important to discuss this and that the whole issue of chronic kidney disease is something that I think we all would be uh, very well situated to know more about because we most likely will know somebody that has kidney disease if it's the eighth leading cause of death in the United States. So Tamara, please be with us and educate us about this important topic. Well, thank you so much for having me here today to talk about chronic kidney disease. And I think most people have the same reaction that you have when we look at the statistics. About 26 million Americans today in our country are living with chronic kidney disease. And that means that some of those individuals are going to require some type of dialysis or transplant therapy, or if they choose not, in some cases, maybe even palliative care such as hospice. We know that there are an additional 73 million Americans who are at risk for kidney disease. And when we look at the risk factors, the leading cause of kidney disease is diabetes. And about 44% of all new cases of patients who start dialysis, it's related to the diabetes that they're experiencing. And we know, unfortunately, that the number each year and in the incidence of diabetes continues to increase in our country. Right. About 11% of our population, of a, our adult population, has chronic kidney disease. And when we look at the national statistics, Pennsylvania and Delaware are t tied as the 12th leading state as far as the numbers of chronic kidney disease. Those states that precede Pennsylvania and Delaware are generally in the south. So the, the incidence is very high. So is it really because of our diet? Is, uh, people are getting these problems to begin with and then it only goes downstream to having the kidney problems? Tell us about that, the diabetes and, and the incidence and prevalence. I mean, it's an epidemic in the United States. So if we don't really crack the code on that, we're going to have more kidney disease is what you're telling us. Absolutely, absolutely. And so diabetes is that leading cause. It's been the leading cause for a number of years and we continue to see that it's going to continue to be the leading cause. And a lot, a lot of that is related to the diet, our lack of mobility, and those individuals who are acquiring type 2 diabetes. And mm -hmm. when the 
when the individual acquires type 2 diabetes, what we know is immediately the damaging effects of that diabetes start to target the kidney mm -hmm. and really target the vessels of the kidney. And over a prolonged period of time, that va vessel damage within the kidney leads to varying stages of kidney failure. We also know that the second leading cause of kidney failure is hypertension. And if you look at the statistics for hypertension in our country, again, we see that the number of individuals on an annual basis with hypertension are starting to increase. And I think what's doubly scary is because of the obesity uh, epidemic, in addition to lack of mobility, we're seeing that hypertension and diabetes are now starting to affect our youth. So my concern as a nephrology nurse going forward is we're gonna to start to see individuals younger and younger experiencing damage to those kidneys and in those early stages of kidney disease. And generally we know with those early stages of kidney disease, those individuals in many cases, unless they can correct and control the diabetes and the hypertension, they're gonna to progress to that final stage of kidney disease, which becomes failure, and those individuals are gonna require dialysis, transplant. They're gonna have some difficult decisions they're gonna to have to make. Absolutely, tell us again how many people that get diagnosed with diabetes wind up with kidney problems? Well, again, on an annual basis, we find out that about 44% of those individuals who are starting dialysis are starting dialysis because they have diabetes. So that's, that's nearly like, half. Yes, exactly. So I don't think most people that get diagnosed with diabetes have any clue that this is a possible consequence. Exactly, and I think most people don't really realize that and that the control of their diabetes is really essential in protecting the health of that kidney. And when the individuals say, you know, I'm gonna eat what I wanna eat, I'm gonna have the sugar, I'm gonna, you know, kind of skip my insulin now and then, each time they do that, they're causing damage to that kidney tissue. And over a prolonged period of time, and for each patient, when I say prolonged, that can be a very different period of time, but over a prolonged period of time, that kidney is being targeted, those tissues and those vessels are being damaged. Right. And when we get to the point where the kidneys have moved to a state of failure, there's no reversing that failure. There's no going back. So prevention and control of diabetes and hypertension are absolutely essential to preserve the health of that kidney. Right. Well, you have a graphic that I think might be very uh, helpful because if you could just walk us through what the kidney actually does, because many of our viewers are really not anatomically knowledgeable about what all the different uh, functions of, of these organs do. So I think it's good just for all of us to have a little refresher course on, on what, what we depend upon our kidneys to do for us every day. Thank you, and I really appreciate that question because many times when we look at the human body, we hear a lot about the heart, we hear a lot about the lungs, and I think people don't really realize the importance of the kidney, and when that kidney fails, that essentially every organ within our body, and even the hair on our head and our toenails, and every system in between is impacted by the kidney failure. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really is important for us to understand that the kidney is responsible for the filtration of our blood. And when the kidney filters our blood, it has a number of roles. One is to remove waste products. It's a wonderful, strong filtering organ. And it removes those waste products from the mm -hmm. foods that we drink and the liquid, the foods that we eat and the liquids that we drink. It'll remove those things that our body no longer needs, such as excessive amounts of potassium and a number of other waste products mm -hmm. such as phosphorus and magnesium. It's also responsible for filtering out the fluid that our body no longer needs. We had that large cup of Wawa coffee this morning and what happened about an hour later? You had to run to the bathroom, right? <laughs> and that's because your body did not need all of that fluid that you had consumed this morning when you were drinking that mm -hmm. cup of coffee or mm -hmm. that cup of that iced tea or that even that water. And so it rid, so our kidneys rid the body of fluid and waste products. The kidney also does a wonderful job in making a couple of hormones that helps keep our blood cell count, particularly our red blood cell count in balance, and it also makes a hormone that helps us absorb calcium. So for patients who have kidney failure, not only are they holding on to extra fluid, they're not filtering the waste products, they may have low calcium levels, and they can have a condition we call anemia because they don't have enough red blood cells. Right. So, so those are some of the key actions in addition to controlling blood pressure. That is, it's a really very uh, intricate organ and one that, as you say, you know, we, we depend upon. 
But I, again, don't think that the average person uh, really understands the connection with diabetes. So mm -hmm. walk us through what happens in diabetes and how it really attacks these cells. Sure, absolutely. So when an individual has diabetes, and particularly when their blood sugar is out of control, what we see is that lack of control of blood sugar really affects the vessels, mm -hmm. particularly some of the smaller vessels in the kidney. And the kidney is responsible for filtering blood. So if the blood cannot make it to the kidney to be filtered because there's damage to these vessels, then these individuals are going to have poor filtration. They're not going to have the removal of those waste products. They're not going to have the removal of the, the um, fluid that's starting to accumulate. And so essentially, over a prolonged period of time, because of that damage to the vessel, because the sugar is not being filtered out and it's damaging that vessel wall, the individual starts to have failing of that kidney tissue. Right, right. And there's, as I think it's really important to emphasize that it is irreversible because you're really damaging these cells and they, they really cannot repair themselves. It is a permanent state. Mm -hmm. um, how about the, the uh, hypertension, the high blood pressure? Walk us through how that works and, and it can be very also damaging to the kidney. Absolutely. Um, when I was the clinical nurse specialist at Thomas Jefferson, I'd often see patients before dialysis, before they needed to start dialysis to talk about options. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'd have to try to figure out, you know, what caused their kidney failure. What we know about hypertension is hypertension causes failure, kidney failure, because again, those vessels are being damaged because of the high pressure that's mm -hmm. within the kidney. In addition to that, when the kidneys start to fail, they lose their ability to regulate blood pressure because that's one of the roles of the kidney. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it comes back to that chicken and egg kind of story. Sometimes the hypertension causes the kidney failure, but the kidney failure also causes that blood pressure or hypertension to be out of control. The bottom line is precise control of blood pressure is essential to preserve, again, the health of that kidney, but also after they have kidney failure, it's going to be a challenge to control that blood pressure as well. Right. So I think, you know, in summary, diabetes, it, the damage is done, it's really what they call a metabolic disease. It's really a chemical exchange that does not work and, and it really destroys the tissue. In hypertension, it's really more the pressure. It's forcing too much pressure uh, against something that has natural resistance because it can't take all that pressure, and therefore, it's just beating against those cells in a way that they, they, they give out to as well. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what the cause is. The bottom line is that the damage in both cases is really, is really permanent, leading to a very painful, very difficult set of treatment options. Mm -hmm to say nothing of the cost. How much is it costing us in healthcare to really have all these people on dialysis? Yeah, the, the costs continue to increase in, year in and year out. And one of the things that we know about the cost with dialysis is it is covered. It's one of the only types of health care in, in the United States that really is covered um, by our governments. And that has been since the early 1970s when selection committees were deciding who could go on dialysis and who couldn't. And Medicare and Medicaid stepped in and provided the resources. So it is costing our country billions of dollars annually to support these patients on dialysis. Mm -hmm. if, if every person that had either hypertension or diabetes followed the letter of the law of, mm -hmm. their, of their treatment regime, do you think that would make a huge impact in this? I definitely think it would definitely make a huge impact if they, you know, if they could follow their diabetic diet, take their insulin, um, and if our patients with hypertension could have ongoing screening, stay within the health system to make sure that their blood pressure is well controlled with antihypertensives, hypertensives, diet, again with both of these groups of patients, exercise, mobility, trying to keep the weight within control, those are all important steps to preserve the time that those patients have strong kidney function. Certainly there are, go there are a number of other conditions that affect the kidney that may not be able to be controlled as well. But with hypertension and diabetes, the patients can definitely have a very uh, important role in, in mm. controlling their disease process and protecting these very vital, complex right. organs. But in your professional opinion, uh, Tamara, do you feel that we're doing enough education of, of the public on this? I absolutely don't. When we look at 
chronic kidney disease as being the eighth leading cause of death in our country, there is no doubt. And those that, you know, unfortunately it continues to, you know, raise higher and higher and get closer to, you know, five or four. Um, I don't think we are doing enough and I don't think individuals know. I mean, I can even speak for my nursing students at Villanova when I tell them that chronic kidney disease is the eighth leading cause of death in our country, they're, they're astonished. So if our nursing students don't know that, I don't believe that the general public knows, and I believe that, that we need more education. We need more primary care and preventative right, care. Right. We need those blood pressure screenings. We see them you know, in our churches. We see them in our parishes. We see them in the community, and people walk by them, but it's really getting to the fundamental assessment of an individual with hypertension being told, oh, your blood pressure today is 150 over 88. You need to follow up with your nurse practitioner or physician. You need to make sure that you mm -hmm. stay on top of this. So those, those what sound like sometimes elementary steps are essential steps. Because what we know about, if we talk about hypertension, we know it's called the what? It's the silent killer. Because we can walk around with high blood pressure day in and day out. That damage is occurring at that vessel level, that vascular level, and individuals don't know it. Right. Boy, this is like, I think, putting everybody on high alert. Uh, because I do think that often when you get, go for some of these screenings, people are sort of casual about it. You know, they'll say, okay, well, my blood pressure is a little bit elevated. Or unless they're having other symptoms like headache, uh, other things that, that are really much more sort of red flags, it would be easy to sort mm -hmm. of just say, oh, I'll take care of that later. Mm -hmm. But I think your point is very well taken that your body doesn't forget. Mm -hmm. I mean, every day it's, it's really dealing with this mm -hmm. as best as can until it gives out. Mm -hmm. And once it gives out, then you're really in for the long haul. Yeah, you're at a point of no return. Right. You really are at that point because once that, once that kidney has failed, it's failed. And sometimes the kidney, you know, it, it gives you some warning signs very early on because there are five stages. There's four stages before you get to that final stage. And when you get to that stage where you only have about 10 to 20 percent of your kidney function left, that's when some of the decisions that you've referred to, such as dialysis, transplant, maybe none of the above, when those decisions need to be made. Right. So it tells you really how resilient that organ is. And so if we can take good care of it, it's gonna take good care of us. Right, right. So you can have these disorders. You can have uh, diabetes, you can have high blood pressure, but if you are not controlling them, this is what you're looking at. If you're controlling it, you can, you can do fine for a lifetime. I mean, that's the good news in all of this. Tell us about the stages. Educate right. us about the stages. Absolutely. There's five different stages uh, when we talk about chronic kidney disease. And the first stage is kind of a kind of a what we say insidious or quiet stage, where the individual may notice that they're possibly odd, oddly enough urinating more frequently. So they're peeing more frequently, and maybe they're getting up at night uh, because their bladder feels full, uh, or maybe they're, they're urinating more frequently during the day. And then we move to more of the middle stages where during this stage they notice that they're not urinating as frequently. And they possibly go in for their health physical and the physician or the nurse practitioner says, ah, we're starting to see some changes in your blood work. We're starting to see something that we call blood urea nitrogen which is a BUN, we start to see that that number increases or your creatinine increases. And that tells us that some of those toxins, those poisons that the kidney, fa that kidney filters are starting to, st they're still they're staying in the body. And then individuals may notice that they start to have higher blood pressure or maybe they have high blood pressure for the first time, indicating that that fluid is starting to stay in the body. And as I stated, Generally, the patients can stay in these in-between stages until they've lost about 80 to 90 percent of their kidney function. Boy. So again, that kidney is a really resilient organ and it works very well to compensate for the loss. But when, when we're down to about 10 to 20 percent of kidney function, the patients are going to be eating poorly, they're going to be sleeping poorly, they may say, oh my goodness, I'm starting to feel really forgetful. Um, or I'm having nausea daily, I feel very tired, I feel very weak, and now we know that that kidney is really in its final stages of failure. And again, unfortunately, when the patients reach this point, there's no regeneration of that failed kidney. At that point, 
the patient is going to need to consult with the nurse practitioner, the physician, mm -hmm. the nephrology nurse, to look at what their options are, and discussions are going to need to mm -hmm. happen at that point. How about in those earlier stages, though, if someone were to really move in and start really being mm -hmm. aggressive about their care, can they reverse out of some of that? They can't really reverse out of it, but at that point we really say it's conservative therapy. And I always like to say we conserve to preserve. We can mm -hmm. do some we can teach them conservative measures. And again, teaching comes into play here. Right. Absolutely key. We're gonna teach them to make some decisions about medications that they should take or shouldn't take. Believe it or not, that good old common over-the-counter ibuprofen, which we know is Motrin many times, mm -hmm. that in large doses or even doses over several days for a patient who has some damage to their kidneys can be really toxic to that kidney. And so it actually decreases the blood flow to the kidney. And so we would teach our patients, avoid ibuprofen. You really should not be taking it because if you do, you're gonna be damaging your kidney. We're gonna teach them about certain antibiotics that can be damaging to the kidney. And some patients may need to go for different types of studies that may require what we call a contrast dye, mm -hmm. a dye study. Again, that dye can be very damaging to the kidney. And so if we're trying to preserve that remaining kidney mm -hmm. function or tissue, we're gonna teach them, some, teach them things to preserve. Right, that is amazing. Um, in terms of teaching, I mean, once someone is in a, a stage uh, mm -hmm. or, and is starting to progress down that slippery slope of, of getting more symptomatic mm -hmm. because of their, their fact is that they're really, their body is poisoning itself. It's true. Um, what kind of interventions are there from a teaching perspective? I mean, have you seen any programs that you think really sort of got people's attention and they moved from being completely unaware or somewhat aware to like really moving in, that they've, they've understood it, they're now motivated to do all this? Mm -hmm. I think that becomes a challenge. Um, because in, there are a number of programs that are out there by the National Kidney Foundation, a number of organizations that are really trying to get to these patients very early. I mean, for some patients, yes, they're gonna heed the call because mm -hmm. they've unfortunately reached this point of fear. Right. Oh my goodness, I'm afraid, you know, I, this is worse than I really thought it was. Right. And so they do start to uh, control their diet, they start to move, then maybe they'll lose some weight, they're gonna control their blood pressure better, they're gonna follow up with their healthcare provider more frequently to stay on top of this, have more frequent blood monitoring. Some patients do, and I have to say within practice, there are some patients who unfortunately live in a state of denial, and they kind of turn their back on it and say, well, I'm not, I don't think it's gonna happen to me. I've been okay for the last 15 years, mm -hmm. and I think I'm gonna be okay for the next 15 years. Right. But there are a number of, there's a number of free health screening programs out there that mm -hmm. are quite comprehensive, that move beyond just doing a screening for blood pressure. They will actually on site, and one of, uh, one of the programs is an early intervention kidney program run by the National Kidney Foundation, and I've actually worked in this program where we we do everything from blood pressure screenings to blood screenings where we draw the blood and run it on site to urine screenings because what we know if we look at the urine, if that individual is starting to have some protein in their urine, the protein should not be in the urine and that tells us that that kidney is starting to fail mm -hmm. and that filter in the kidney is failing and that's a very, very early sign mm -hmm. that this patient is moving through those stages of kidney failure. But if we can get to them early and control the hypertension, the diabetes, and do some of those other health promoting factors that we just talked about, they can slow that process well, down. That, that's great. So I just want to sort of get a picture of this because this more aggressive screening, are they doing this or offering this for communities just to do on general people? Yes, absolutely. And one of the things that the, the National Kidney Foundation does is they actually will put this information out to physician, physicians' offices. Mm -hmm. A nephrologist is a particular type of physician who works with patients who have varying stages of kidney failure. So they'll put these flyers out and say, come to Philadelphia, come to Norristown, we're gonna have this screening on a Saturday morning. It's free of charge. There are a number of organizations that support this. And so you walk in, and you will walk out of that screening knowing you need to plan to be there a good hour. Mm -hmm. but you're gonna walk out knowing the health of your kidneys at that point. 
The amazing. wonderful, wonderful programs. Right. But let's just say, if everybody was in primary care, I mean, we are moving to a new insurance system where mm -hmm. there, there will be access, hopefully, mm -hmm. for people to get primary care. Mm -hmm. If everyone in an ideal world was in primary care mm -hmm. and seeing their, uh, their health care team at least once a year, mm -hmm. wouldn't this be picked up by general testing? It definitely would be picked up by general testing, yes. By general blood testing, again, when you go in for your health physical annually, the tests that we do to screen for the function of the kidney is part of that health screening. So it would be picked up, absolutely. If they run a urinalysis, where they take a urine sample, it could be picked up in that way as right, well, definitely. Right, right. So these other screenings that are, are really very um, important, uh, very impressive, maybe would not necessarily need to be done if everyone was enrolled in primary care. You're absolutely correct. Right, which really would be the better route to go than just trying to screen people, mm -hmm. like walking walking at an mm -hmm. event, for instance, to spend an hour to get this very um, uh, aggressive kind of mm -hmm. screening. I mean aggressive in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. um, and then have to find out like who they're going to go to mm -hmm. for treatment. That's sort of like, in some ways, doing it backwards. Mm -hmm. If you're in primary care, which I think is one of the whole ideas of screening, prevention, mm -hmm that you would be able to take more aggressive steps much earlier in this process. Absolutely, without a doubt, and that's the promise of the right. Affordable Care Act, is right. that these individuals will enter the system earlier, and we will hopefully stop or at least slow down their progression right. through these five stages. So, I mean, one, one of the, uh, nothing happens overnight, as we know, certainly in healthcare. Um, Ten years down the road, after everyone is at least given the option, for the most part, to enroll in primary care, mm -hmm. we could hopefully see a big dent and decrease in these numbers. And, and we hope that that's going to happen, absolutely. And um, healthcare organizations and even our government through some of the indicators in a program called Healthy People 2020 mm -hmm. have really targeted chronic kidney disease mm -hmm. as one of the major disease groups that we're looking at. So yes, and, and they have some initiatives that are out there and getting these patients into the primary care system is one of the initiatives so that we can put a dent in this. And you know, it would be, would be wonderful someday if nephrology nurses were needed for education and not at the bedside, mm -hmm. you know, conducting dialysis treatments or at least decreasing that and shifting our role into a mm -hmm. different area. I agree. Why do you think it hasn't gotten as much um, play as, as some of our other big ticket diseases, cancer, heart disease, etc. Yeah, that's a really great question and I wish I knew the answer to that because I've always said I'm kind of a cheerleader for the kidney because a lot of people don't know a whole lot about kidney disease. Um, and I wish I knew why individuals really didn't kind of embrace this or even some healthcare providers didn't embrace the importance of this early entry into the system and the screening um, and also just discussions with the patients. I think that the patients really need the information. Definitely. And it sometimes does not transfer mm -hmm. over to the patient. Sometimes they're just told, well, you know, your kidneys are starting to fail, you need to go see you know, a primary care physician or you need to see a nurse practitioner, uh, but they don't really know what that means. And then right. they enter the system, they, they now have a disease that is overwhelming to them and they have a lot of choices to make. And sometimes those patients aren't even aware of what those choices might right. be. And I think that, you know, frankly, if, if one were uh, diagnosed with uh, diabetes and you went and took a tour of, of these units, where people are, are really getting transfused. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult situation. You would not want to see yourself in one of those chairs. You're absolutely right. I, I will never forget, I watched a film once by um, James Michener, who's a famous author who's from the Bucks County area, which is where I hail from right now. And he was on dialysis. And he spent his last few years on dialysis. And James Michener, as an author, said, dialysis, that end stage point of renal failure, kidney failure, was the hardest assignment he was ever given. Right. Um, and so it really, it's, it is a hard task. And our goal is to prevent the patients from getting to that right. point. Right. Well, listen, Tamara, all I can say is, girl, you love those kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> you are really a cheerleader. I mean, I'm sitting here feeling like I've not only learned a lot from you, you're obviously extremely knowledgeable about this, 
but I think you have opened my eyes to the fact that for whatever reasons, we may not be able to dig deep enough to know what they are. Mm -hmm. It has not gotten the attention that it mm -hmm. really, really mm -hmm. sorely needs. Mm -hmm. So maybe you'll come back and give us more information and more, more tips on what people can do because I think this has been a wonderful introduction to a topic that we really don't have a much, much conversation about. And I want to thank you, Tamara, for being with us today. And I want to thank our guests for being with us as well. Have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that the information will help you in meeting your health goals. Catch this program and other conversations on the website, drnancyrn.com. Or you can write to me as well. I welcome your comments and feedback. Thank you for listening and join us again. And remember, with health, all things are possible.